All right, good evening, guys. Let me uh, kind of give an overview of what I went through with the kids and some things to follow up with if you want to. Um, so we did Chapter 8, um, Hopeful Joins Christian, um, in the with the abbreviated version with the kids, the modern uh, one, it's Chapter 8, and then the first page of Chapter 9, so it's pages 137 to 153. And then for the Banner of Truth version, it's uh, pages 112 to 127. So I read until uh, until they leave uh, the river of God. And so I always try to break down the chapters into high points. And so there's five of them. I'm going to try to go quick. But um, the high points is number one, hopeful joining Christian. Number two, there's this conversation with uh, Mr. Buy-ins and then Mr. Money Love, Mr. Hold the World, and Mr. Save All. Uh, and then there's... Uh, Demas and the silver mine, the snare of the silver mine, there's this monumental uh, warning that they come across, and then there's that ends on them being at the river of God. And so we'll just kind of go through each one of those. The first one, Hopeful joins Christian, and so it's a great thing because Hopeful came from Vanity Fair where he saw Faithful's uh, example and Christian's example, but especially Faithful's, and so uh, he switched sides and began following the Lord started the journey and, and he joins Christian. And so uh, great uh, lessons there. The first one Bunyan actually wrote, this is a quote from John Bunyan. He said, so no one, uh, so one died to bear testimony to the truth. That's faithfulness uh, or faithful. And then he says, and another arose out of his ashes to be a companion with Christian in his pilgrimage. Hopeful also told Christian that there would be many more men in the fair who would follow them in due time. And so just a beautiful picture in this allegory of of, of what, uh, I can't remember who said it, but in the early church, that the blood of the martyrs, the blood of the Christians is the seed of the church. And so we see this example of this right here. And, um, and so again, it's a reminder to us, even if we don't die, but God uses the way we respond to life's difficulties as a powerful witness to others. And uh, so, again, you know, there's there's purpose in suffering. And so um, um, so we can gain encouragement from that. And then we see how important it is that we have companions, uh, that God provides companions to walk with on our journey. And we see the importance of the local church and 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 hopefully that the local church is a place to develop relationships that are deeper than uh, that aren't superficial but that are really deep. And we're going to see Hopeful and, and Christian have this a strong relationship uh, uh, right off the bat and as they begin to, to walk through um, life together. And so, and that's how the local church should be. We're walking through life together. We're battles. The whole Christian life is a battle, you know, uh, you know, especially for men who tend to not have deep relationships, uh, you know, but you watch a movie like Band of Brothers or a series Band of Brothers, not, encouraging it but if you've seen it you know that when men go through war together they have a bond that uh th that's deep and, and and that's what uh, uh indeed that's what we should have in, in the local church amongst believers and I'm grateful for many of the men in grace fellowship uh that i have that with but um but anyway so he um uh after that they they start walking and this guy comes up to him and uh, uh, they have this conversation. It's Mr. Byans. It's kind of a weird, you know, we're not as familiar with this, but Byans means having the, it's the idea of having a selfish ambition, having a, a, a covert motives or purpose uh, in our actions. And so um, the idea would be having evasive ways of dealing with things. Uh, ethical things which which cause us to, to compromise um, we would maybe talk about like rationalizing things or or sophistry some people can be so complicated that that we can compromise on very basic things and it's easy to see instead of being single-minded single focused having a single eye it's the idea of being double-minded and, um, and so sometimes those things are very complicated and such, sometimes uh, not. But the point is, is that's what buy-in is, buy-in. And we see that it describes his life, it describes his religion. And so uh, uh, it describes a lot of his relatives, smooth man, facing both ways, Mr. Anything. And so, you know, we can, we can 
really see that's what Bunyan is getting at. And they differ from Christian and Hopeful in two primary ways. Number one, they never strive against wind and tide. Okay? They like religion when it's easy. Number two, they are always the most zealous when when uh, religion travels. Some people have said in silver slippers. Uh, Rebecca mentioned this is a, a metaphor, I think, from Jennifer. I'm not sure, but I think that's what she said. Uh, but the idea of, of, of how much of Christianity is going upstream instead of downstream. And um, and I don't know if that's exactly what she said, but I like the analogy, so I'm going to go with it. Okay. The, the point is, as much of Christianity is going upstream. And there may be times where we can take it easy, uh, and go downstream or whatever, but much of Christianity is upstream. Well, by end, he likes it when it's the downstream. He likes the, the things you get out of religion. And so uh, his name denotes, again, his character and his religion. And so basically the whole point, the picture of Bayans is he's, he's the one that when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to religion, the first thing he asks is what's in it for me. And, um, and this is where I think you have significant, I mean, this is obviously before the whole seeker sensitive movement from the nineties and such two thousands, um, you know, Bunyan's writing in 1688, but this, this is, this is damning to that because when you have uh, uh, churches that are seeking to appeal to people and trying to, to draw them, entice them by what Christianity, what Jesus can provide for them, that is going to attract buy-ins. That's going to attract people who are looking to religion to see what they can get out of it. Uh, there are benefits to religion. You know, if you like work hard and show up and don't just play video games all day, I mean... <laughs> That'll help. I mean, there's blessings to, to, to that, to uh, in obedience to God. And so we see that. I know from my own experiences, as I remember young men who would be willing to be very religious. They'd be catechized. They would do whatever uh, in order to get uh, whatever girl, get her hand in marriage. And, uh, and then, of course, after marriage, it comes to find out, you know, they don't really care a whole lot about the Lord. And so the point is, is when we use religion to get wives get a husband get a boyfriend a girlfriend money you know whatever it might be that's the, that's that's the idea of buy-ins is 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 forgiveness of sins love for christ these are not the the single eye the single minded focus and so christian confronts buy-in says if you go with us you, you you've got to go against wind and tide okay there's going to be difficult times and so buy-in responds he says, number one, sounds like it was written nowadays, but written in 1688, he responds, he says, you can't impose your views on me. Uh, he says, you're not Lord over me. You can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me what my Christianity should look like. Uh, he says, let me do what I want. Uh, he says, I'm never going to desert my old principles and, and I'm going to continue on as I did before you caught up to me. And, uh, and so, again, picture... Well, I'm going to call it downstream Christianity. I like that. Um, some have called it religion in golden slippers. Okay. Some would just call it evangelicalism. No, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. But, um, but the point is, is this idea of, of, of just a Christianity when it's easy. Okay. Uh, Brandon, brother Brandon, when he was preaching Sunday night, he said, Jesus didn't call us. God doesn't talk, call us to put on, you know, he calls us to put on the armor of the Lord. You know, it's not bathrobes for Jesus. And, and so he's getting at the point that, that, you know, the Christian life is taking up a cross, denying ourselves and following Christ. There's there's hardships, there's difficulties, and it. it's fighting sin. It's not just doing what you want. I mean, you know, we don't earn God's love. We're forgiven. But because we are, now there's a battle. You know, if we didn't care what Christ thought, we would live however we wanted. And so anyway, so this downstream Christianity, you see it does what? It takes every advantage to secure your life and estate. That's what we see buy-ins doing. We see that he's for religion when times are, are good and when safety will bear it. Uh, he's, he's content to take the fair weather, um, but he's going to avoid the rain. And, uh, and I think this is why we see in our culture, we're going to see churches suffer, I think, because... There's a lot of buy-ins in American evangelicalism 
And if it's going to cost something to be a Christian in the next 10 years, and again, I'm not a prophet, but it looks that way, 20 years, I mean, golly, things are going so fast, I don't even think it'd take that long. Then um, I think you're going to see people fall away. People are, are fair weather Christians, downstream uh, Christianity. Uh, you know, um, so anyway, so this downstream Christianity, it's the idea of believing in scripture and reasonable, you know, it's gotta be reasonable. Don't be so extreme, so radical. Uh, God has given us good things in life and he wants us to keep them for his sake. Okay. And again, it's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to do well, you know, the, but when the, those become our focus, that's what it's getting at. Uh, the idea of, of, of downstream Christianity carries the idea of what Bians is sharing is altering our principles to fit the disposition of other people. Okay. Changing our principles so that it's palatable to other people so that it doesn't offend them. So that, you know, and again, I've said for years and years, the same sex marriage issues that we are dealing with today didn't start uh, with a Burgerfeld in was that 2015 16 when i wrote 2015 i think it was but the point is it didn't start then it's like it started you know in the 70s 80s with pastors being willing to uh, overlook di divorce and remarry people okay uh, see the point is is those little compromises add up and bunyan is just nailing these 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 issues um uh he the Another one is using religion to obtain a better salary. He actually uses the example of a pastor. And again, I'm not completely against pastors moving on to other churches and such, but, but for the most part, every time a pastor, every time a God calls a pastor to another church, you ever notice that it's always a bigger church? Again, that doesn't mean it's always wrong. I'm not saying anything like that, but is it never covetousness? Never? I mean, I know you can't say that, but I'll say it. Um, uh, anyway, so using your religion to obtain a better salary, a rich spouse, uh, better customers. It's The big thing for Bunyan's is this. Being religious is always virtuous. And again, the Bible and Bunyan's getting at, it's not. Motives matter. Now, none of us have perfect motives or have had perfect motives our Christian life, entire Christian life. But he's 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 getting at something more serious, and you see that when Christian uh, answers by ends, because he says number one, it's unlawful to follow Christ for bread, and he quotes Jesus' words about the people following him for loaves. Then he says the Pharisees used religion this way. This is how they were. He says Judas was religious in order to get money. Uh, he says Simon the sorcerer wanted the Holy Spirit so he could get money. So I'm just saying like. Those three are not a good group you want to be lumped with. The Pharisees, Simon the Sorcerer, and Judas Iscariot. Like, and so Christian says, this is, you know, these are the people that you're following, that you look up to. Uh, and then he says, anyone who takes up religion for the world will throw away religion for the world as well. And, uh, and so that's where we see, again, the motives make the man. None of us have perfect motives, but if Christ isn't our focus, we're not single-minded and uh and that's where we're, we're, we're fundamentally at what jesus said no one can serve two masters where either he will hate the one and serve the other or he will hold to the one and despise the other you cannot serve god and mammon and uh so again true christianity involves the cross it involves denying ourselves and it, it it's it involves surrendering our our will to please god and not just please ourselves and so that's what the whole conversation with buy-ins and money, love, and all them is, is about. And so then they go on and they, they come to a pleasant plane called ease. And we've really been, Bunyan does so good about showing how uh, Christian life, it's fighting the fight. And I think it's biblical. And I think, I think we live in a day and age where there's so much let go and let God and just like all you got to do is empty yourself. And then if you've got the spirit, you're just going to live right. And, and I mean, don't get me started just that's not how the christian life is presented uh we're dependent upon the spirit amen uh but but there's there's a diligence there's a a, a, a pressing forward a, a, a being diligent in our 
walk with God and fighting sin and, and all these sorts of things that we see. But Bunyan wasn't just reacting to our current culture today. Um, and so again, he, he, he recognizes that God often brings pleasant times in our lives. And so they, they come across the pleasant plane called ease. Uh, God gives them rest and, uh, uh, you know, for their, for their body and soul. And, uh, uh, but it, he does note that it's narrow and they went across it quickly. Uh, again, fighting sin, tribulation, difficulties, persecution, that's the norm in the Christian life, but we do see there are times that God gives us the uh, pleasant plain called ease. And then they come to this little hill called Lucre. And Lucre, again, is old word, but the idea is, is gain, profit. The King James really made famous, I think it's still famous, uh, filthy Lucre. So the idea of Lucre is more dishonestly gotten gain. Um, it's greed. And, uh, and so this is what this is, this little hill called Lucre. And then, uh, and notice it's little. And I think Bunyan is trying to help us understand that, that or emphasize the perception that, that, that greed is often seen. Desire for money is often seen as just a little thing compared to these other sins. And again, it's not that it's wrong to have ambition or to make money or to, to, to work hard. But, but when that consumes us, when we love money more than God, and that's what I try to emphasize with the kids on it much more basic level. And so, um, um, you know, but when desire for things and money becomes, uh, grabs hold of our heart, it's not harmless and relatively acceptable. And, uh, and indeed that's what we see. It's, it's, it's shaky ground. It's, it's shaky ground. And so, um, so while they're there on this little, hi this little hill of, uh, almost said difficulty, but uh, Lucre, um, the uh, Demas calls for Christian and hopeful and tells him to come, leave the path, come see. He, he says, there's this silver mine. You can dig treasure. I mean, who does that not appeal to? Uh, you can become rich with little effort. I mean, and so uh, Christian then, he counsels hopeful. And this is where we again see iron sharpening iron and, and, and how important it is to have companions, fellow believers who will tell us things that maybe we don't want to hear. Uh, he counsels hopeful and then he answers Demas, but his counsel to hopeful is, he says, man, I've heard of this place. He, and he, he says, and many have been killed here. Okay. And, and, and we think of first Timothy six, verse 10 says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And there's, there's so much examples of the, the deceitfulness of riches and, and the love of money. We're going to hear a lot of it in the Gospel of Luke as Pastor, Pastor Josh continues preaching through Luke. And so um, uh, he says the treasure, is it's a snare to those who seek it. Uh, he says it hinders pilgrims on their pilgrimage. Uh, and so he says, let's not take one step in that direction. And that's a great picture of what our our uh, response to temptation towards sin should always be don't take one step and, and, um, and, he's, and, he, and he says you know to hopeful we need to stay on the path and uh, and so again just the importance of good friends is such a good thing for these kids to hear especially but and for adults I mean we need good friends and then Christian answers Demas and he says you're an enemy of the king and uh, and you're an enemy of his ways he says, you've already been condemned and now you're trying to bring us into your condemnation. He says, your relatives, he compares them to uh, Jehazi, the servant to Elisha that, that lied to try to get money from Naaman. And uh, he's in 2 Kings 5.20 if you want to read it. But he ended up with leprosy. And then he compared him to Judas, okay, who uh, obviously ended, you know, uh, what he did for money and ended up committing suicide. And so Demas then, is this one who's already been condemned? Well, who is he? Many of you guys know, but Demas is mentioned three times in the New Testament. Two times are somewhat positively. Uh, he's an assistant to the Apostle Paul in Colossians 4, verse 14, Philemon, verse 23 and 24. Uh, so he, he's a friend and, a, and a, a ministry partner with Paul. And so, you know, I told the kids, you know, that's like, you know, being a teammate to Wayne Gretzky. Now, they don't really know Wayne Gretzky, so I used the example of Tom Brady. I thought they might know him, but 
Like, can you imagine like being a teammate to one of these greats? And that's the idea of Paul, you know, great missionary, apostle of the Gentiles. He was a ministry partner with him. But he was also mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, verses 9 and 10, as having deserted Paul. The word for deserted is he, he left him behind. He forsook him. He abandoned him. Okay? Uh, while Paul was in prison. And he did it. Why? It goes on in 2 Timothy uh, 4 to say he did it because he loved this present world. And um, and so, again, he loved the world. So, I mean, if that doesn't bring to mind 1 John 2, verse 15, do not love the world nor the things in the world. What? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so we see Demas uh, working with Paul, but yet deserting and leaving him. Why? Because... He loved the things of this world. Uh, the The word for this present world is literally the now time. And in the context of, of 2 Timothy 4, he's comparing uh, the faithful pastor and being one who, uh, uh, he, he describes a reward for those who love the appearing of Christ, who love his appearing. And then right after that, you have this Demas who loved the now time. And so I think you get this picture especially in light of where this is about to go, you get this picture of loving loving Christ and the desire to be with him more than wanting to be back here. More than wanting. Like if Christ comes, would you be kind of disappointed? Is, is almost this, this, this uh, 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 dichotomy that's being presented. And, uh, and so that leads to the next thing they see, and that's a statue of Lot's wife. We went through the story of that with the kids. Most of you guys, all of you guys, I'm sure know that. Not going to explain how Jesus said those very words, remember Lot's wife. Just try to emphasize four things when it comes to Lot's wife. Number one, uh, it seems a small thing to look behind, but it was a great sin. Uh, number two, it was a great sin. Why? Because it disobeyed an explicit command of God, and that's never a small sin. Uh, number three, she desired to go back. She desired earth more than heaven, and that was the issue. And then number four, uh, you know, she was being saved from the wrath of God and Sodom, and then uh, and then looked back and ended up being judged by God. And so, understand, being almost saved isn't isn't being saved. Uh, there, you know, and the, here she is now, this monument, even all the way down to us, 2023, looking back and considering the things that her heart being in this world instead of uh, uh, for the Lord, what that pictured. And so, uh, so anyway, so they see this monument and Christian reminds uh, hopeful of these things and the deceitfulness of riches and all that of this world. And then they go on to the river of God, which is obviously drawing heavily from Revelation 22, you know, fruit trees on both sides of the, the river. Uh, so for resting, restoration, and again, one of these good times God gives them uh, to help prepare them for further kingdom uh, usefulness. And so um, uh, so hopefully those things help you with uh, following up with your kids and 